Salutations, people. Welcome to Page 3 Killers, Murders That Went Unnoticed, a podcast where we dive into the murder cases that went unnoticed by our nation's newspapers. Hi, Shay. Hey, John. Hi, people. Hi, guys. Welcome back. And welcome to episode 14, Page 3 Killers, Murders That Went Unnoticed. Wow, you got that right two weeks in a row. I didn't even stumble this time, and we didn't have to re-record it. (laughs) Which is perfect. Now, this week, we have a neat case to talk about. We are leaving the United States for this one. Do you know 20% of our listeners are from Europe? Ooh, really? That's a fact. Welcome to our our European listeners. (laughs) Well, I'm just saying, now we're we're headed over there for an episode. Yep, and we are heading uh, over to Scotland. I imagine people in Scotland probably know about this. Yes. It probably. I mean, we're... So this week we're talking about the World's End murders out of Edinburgh, Scotland. So it's the end of the world? Like, everyone gets murdered? No. Like, you would think I would have heard about that one. No, it's it's a bar, um, a pub that's on, uh, like, a, a busy street, like a bar street, you know. So it's like their bourbon street. Yes, it's like their Bourbon Street, um, and it's in Edinburgh's Old Town. So this case is from 1977. Oh, wow. I thought this was like a newer pub. No, nope. This is like a like an old, old pub. But before we get into the case, let's talk about our drink special. Woo! Woo, woo! <laughs> And we're back with another drink segment. This week, we are in Scotland, so it is only appropriate that we have a little bit of a scotch. This particular cocktail, scotch isn't a very particularly popular cocktail drink. Uh, It has very strong flavors. You really want to drink it on your own. Every once in a while, got mixed up a little bit. And uh, being that we are a true crime podcast, we have The Blood and Sand. Apparently named after a movie. Never heard of it. But, I don't know. Apparently it's popular. I'm going to start off with a little bit of uh, scotch, 1.5 ounces of scotch, one ounce of cherry liqueur, one ounce of vermouth, one ounce of orange juice, and don't be stingy, squeeze your own orange juice, and a half an ounce of lemon juice. Pretty simple uh, put together here. We're just going to add everything into our shaker with some ice, shake it up, strand it out, pour it into your cocktail glass, and garnish with an orange peel. Nice, simple, easy, as most of our cocktails are. I don't try to be too complicated here. But that is our blood and sand cocktail for this week. Enjoy. Okay, and we are back from that amazing drink special. Now, we're going to start moving into our news topics. So we had some some big news topics uh, that were kind of important for that year. That was a lot of them. 77 was a busy year. Yeah, yeah. It was It was a real busy, busy year. So we start off with uh, Jimmy Carter being sworn in as the 39th president of the United States. And he automatically pardons uh, Vietnam War draft uh, evaders. So both these are kind of big deal. Yeah. Uh, I know that a lot of people really ticked off. Jimmy Carter was one of our better presidents, in my opinion. And people hated him. I don't know why. I mean, he wasn't perfect, but people really hated him. And he started off on the wrong foot with his Vietnam draft Dodgers thing. Oh, yeah. I, I can see where it would, like, piss off everybody that, like, actually went and, ser- like, served in Vietnam. And they're just like, fuck you. <laughs> Pretty much anyone who served in Vietnam, which at this time was, uh, well, only a few years done. Or anyone who knew anyone who served in Vietnam or particularly knew anyone who died in Vietnam, like, those people were just pissed. Yeah, I can see how, how that would upset a lot of people. So let's move into the next one. Hanafi? Hanafi Siege, um, which was uh, approximately a dozen armed Hanafi movement members, took over three buildings in Washington, D.C. Uh, they ended up killing uh, one person and taking 130 people hostage. And it took uh, two days for the hostage situation to end. Imagine that going on right now. People lost their damn minds 
over a bunch of Trump supporters taking selfies inside of the Capitol. And it was like two weeks straight of nothing but the insurrection. Still hear about it. Yeah. Imagine if this happened. Oh, this would be just like all over. It would be all over. This is essentially like the end of the world compared to what goes on today. Yeah. This, This kind of stuff just does not happen in America anymore. People do not realize, like, how, how good they have it. Oh, yeah. Just in, ge- in the world in general right now. And I think this is a great example. Literally 130 hostages from a terrorist organization over two days. Which is crazy. Like, And I've never heard of this. Well, we weren't alive in 1977, so. A bunch of people with iPhones ended the media for two weeks. Yeah. This is nuts. I can just imagine how much this must have been on the news over that that two-day period, not to mention the weeks following. I think this is a, if I'm not mistaken, I believe this is probably a response to Carter as well. Uh, The Middle East really hated Carter, and they tried everything they could to make him look bad. Yeah. All right, well, enough about politics. Now I got something to lighten the mood a little bit. All right, so... In April, we have residents of Dover, Massachusetts, report sightings of an eerie monster. I think I read a book about this. <laughs> like, I'm not kidding. I'm pretty sure there's a book about this specific uh, monster. Yeah. I, I, I literally do not know which monster it was referring to. The I'm eerie like, monster. That's right. Oh, I, I actually don't know that. I thought maybe it was, like, Mothman or something. I couldn't remember where that happened at, though. I don't know. I didn't do the research for this episode. I'm looking at you. Pardon me. (laughs) I just put it in there because I thought it was funny. Um, Now, the next thing... The next thing I feel like is uh, nobody cared about this, except for, like, 12 people at the time. Yeah. Okay, so... The first optical fiber, uh, optical fiber is first used to carry live telephone traffic. There's like the handful of engineers who worked on the project and then the people who had to lay the line who were just really angry about it because it was a new thing and they probably were messing it up the whole time. Yeah. And And then it became one of the most important things they've ever done in their lives. Exactly. Without this, our country doesn't operate the way it does today. Yeah, no. (laughs) No, it's true. It's absolutely true. All right, then the next one I have here is George Lucas' Star Wars opens in cinemas and becomes the highest grossing film of all time. So what you're saying is nerds stop paying attention to the world for... Yes. Nine months out of this year. Eight months. Oh, yeah. I'm pretty sure, like, starting... um, Because this, I believe, happened in May... Literally, the moment the trailers probably dropped, they probably stopped paying attention to anything else. <laughs> and they were just like, oh, a new movie? This looks fabulous. It's got Harrison Ford in it. <laughs> Everyone thought this was going to flop. I know. Even the actors. The actors thought it was terrible. Oh, yeah. my I remember my mom taking, uh, hearing about my mom taking my aunt to go see this. And the entire time, my aunt was just like, well, I guess if we have to be there early, I want popcorn and candy. And she didn't want to be there. And then at the end of the movie, she's like, are you going to bring me back for the next one? <laughs> oh, they already knew there was going to be a next one? Like, was this a planned trilogy? Uh, I don't think so. But she was like, if they make another one, will you yeah. take me to go see it? And my mom was like, oh, coming from the person that didn't want to see Star Wars. Now, the next one was a really big one. I've seen a couple documentaries on this. It was really big. So in New York City, they had a blackout, um, which was dubbed the New York City blackout of 1977. Super creative name. Yes. It lasts for 25 hours, which results in looting and just basically chaos. Across the city. For one day. For one day. Like, 
I just remember watching this um, uh, documentary and it just showed cops just standing around like not even doing anything because they were just like, yeah, I'm not fucking dying today. Yeah, I mean, they're not they're not there to protect and serve. No, I mean, like they're they have families to go home to, so they got to uh, they got to ask themselves, are, are they really going to put the, put their life on the line for property that's probably insured? Yeah, exactly. probably not. Exactly. Uh, next, we have the Senate, the United States Senate starts its hearings on my favorite thing to talk about, MK Ultra. So you mean that time where the United States government decided to drug up a bunch of people and see if they can mind control them? Yes. And literally. <laughs> yeah. And I, I believe they, they used, uh, what was it? LSD? I don't know if it was LSD or psilocybin, but it was one of them. Yeah, I believe they, they, I know that part of the MK Ultra files they did have, um, where they gave top, and they gave it to them without them knowing about it. That's the worst part, and messed these people up. Yeah, Just they, Google this. They totally fucked people up. And I believe that there is one person that actually died from it. Um, and they covered it up, of course. It's a conspiracy. They covered up the death and made it look like a suicide. Um, but yeah. You guys should look into that. Really interesting. The next time you ever think to yourselves, oh, the government would never. Just, then just Google MK Ultra and be like, oh, oh, they probably would. Yeah. <laughs> now, the last two things on our good things for 1977 are kind of sad. So we're going to end that on some sad note. We have Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll. Dies in his home in Graceland at age 42. Most importantly, he died on his toilet. Don't forget. 75,000 fans line the streets in Memphis for his funeral, which occurs uh, on August 18th. That's it? Only 75,000? <laughs> no, I'm like, I, I figured that would be like a million. Well, I mean, I'm sure that there was so so many people that they couldn't get to Memphis. Like... To be there? Because they have jobs and lives. I guess he also wasn't particularly famous. I mean, he was famous, but I guess he wasn't at, like... We're not talking, like, 1958 Elvis swinging his hips and, you know... School gyms with girls screaming at the top of their lungs. This was a slightly overweight tassels and a huge hairdo Elvis... Really sad. And then the last one, you have English comedian and silent film actor Charlie Chatwin dies in his home in Switzerland from a stroke at the age of 88. I was going to say a joke, but it is so wildly offensive that I don't think I should say it. Well, you can say it if it's too offensive. I'll cut it out. Okay. Charlie Chaplin, his mustache was the biggest. Well, it's not really a joke. See, now I ruined it. I can't say it now. Were you going to make a... Uh, a Hitler joke, Hitler. of course. Of course I was going to make a Hitler reference. But I guess that's a joke. The joke I mean, is I was going to make a Hitler reference, so it's too offensive. So we're not going to do that. Now. I mean, that that one... Uh, what was it? The Great Dictator? Is the... It's the silent film where Charlie Chaplin pretends to be Hitler. Oh, yeah. And at the end, he gives this monologue, and you're just like... It's the first time you've ever heard him actually speak, and he gives this entire monologue at the end about how, you know, we should just love each other and not hate and all this other stuff. Um, that Everyone should watch that. Basically uh, against Hitler. Yeah, because you know? Hitler was still up in the air at the time. It, like, we didn't know whether or not we liked him or not. Yeah. I mean, the Holocaust really hadn't... No one... The Holocaust no one really wasn't knew. a thing yet, either, so... Now, I mean, that's one of, like, the best Charlie Chaplin films, I think. So, that's really sad. Now, we're going to move into our seedy side. You ready for this? Buckle your seatbelt? Go for it. There's actually not that many. Uh, yeah. So, we have James Earl Ray escapes from the Bush Mountain State Prison in Pedros, Tennessee. He's captured on... Well, recaptured... 
on June 13th. And who's James Earl Ray? Uh, he's the individual who killed Dr. Martin Luther King. All right. Then we have 16-year-old uh, shop assistant Jane MacDonald is murdered by the Yorkshire Ripper in Leeds, England. Now, I just watched a Netflix documentary on this. Super fabulous. Not for her, but just the police work. They ended up catching this guy uh, from a 10-pound note or something. or It, it, was, it was like a... a Literally a, a bill, a, like a a, ten, like yeah. a a bill note that was found in uh, near one of the bodies. They were able to track the number on it. Oh, I I kind of heard this over. You overheard this. Yeah, you listening to it, it was earlier. it was super interesting. Like just the police work on this, and the entire time, everybody is publicly thinking like nothing is being done. Like, the, the, the cops are just in F, that they're not doing anything. And here, they're just, like, they're closing in on the guy, and they can't say anything. Because so they don't want to give it away. They don't want to get uh, suspicious and start hiding out again. Yeah, exactly. Then, to finish out our CD side, we have David Berkowitz, who was known as the Son of Sam, is captured in Yonkers, New York. Uh, after a one-year uh, murder spree. During University. that blackout. Yeah. Right, that was a big deal. During that blackout, it was still summer of Sam. Yep. So they were losing their damn minds. They were, they were losing their fucking minds. So now, let's move into our case. So we are now talking about our main topic, which is the World's End Murders. Now, it sounds like, you know, it would be like something kind of crazy, right? World's End Murders. Again, it sounds like it's the, uh, like someone just set off a nuclear bomb. Yeah. So this is actually uh, the murder of two, uh, I believe they were 17 years old, two uh, young ladies in Edinburgh, Scotland. And their names are Christine Aidy and Helen Scott who were friends, and they went out on a night on the town and sadly did not make it home. So I'm going to go off on this little tangent. It has nothing to do with anything we're talking about, but I had a, I had a teacher in middle school, and he used to call people Benedict Arnolds when they had two first names for, like, like their surname was a first name, and her Helen Scott, and I was just like, oh, she's a Benedict Arnold. <laughs> and I didn't get the, like... The teacher asked the class if they were Benedict Arnold's, and I had no idea what he was talking about. If their names were Benedict Arnold names. Like, three people raised their hand, and I was like, why are these people raising their hands? Did they know? No, apparently, I was just left out of the joke. I was an oh. idiot. And it took me, like, an hour, and I was like, oh, he was talking about having two first names. Oh. That's okay, babe. You You weren't the... The mental giant you are today. Um, I'm going to pretend you never said that. <laughs> this entire case starts on the night of October 15th. Christine, Eddie, and Helen Scott, they're in the mood for celebration. Now, both had, you know, graduated high school um, that they attended together. They had both just started working jobs. And they decided to go out and celebrate with a few of their friends you know just celebrate becoming an adult you know living your life what about the drinking age it was probably like 16 in scotland oh yeah I, I i'm not exactly sure what the drinking age is so any of our european friends that do know hit us up oh, with they're that. all kinds of different over in europe really yeah. yeah like every country's got its own well i don't know maybe the eu changed that but like i know in italy you're you're like at sixteen. You're allowed to drink like a glass. It's like of twelve wine for in Italy. You're allowed to have a glass of wine. Yeah. Or like eight. <laughs> well, that's the thing. They don't. They they like they have a glass they're, of they're wine with dinner. They're responsible. You mean? Compared yeah, to, that's that's to us why in America where we do everything to excess. Well, no, there was just there was actually a study done. They compared um Ireland to Italy because there was like these huge differences in like brawls and fights and like deaths related to alcohol when you compared uh ireland to 
to Italy, and they were like, why? It's the culture. Yeah, because they both actually consumed the same amount of alcohol, and they, they had no idea. They're like, and then they realized, oh, in Ireland, people go out and have 10 drinks, like, once a week, and it's all, you know, it, it's a lot of whiskey. Yeah. And then, and you, then the, you have in Italy where they have, like, a glass, maybe, like, they splurge and have three glasses that night. That's, like, them getting tipsy. Yeah. So, you know, get maybe introducing it at, like you do in Italy is better off. Because then you don't have, here, you, everybody hits 21 or, you know, <clears throat> 18. And they just go a little nuts. This is, like, our third tangent, and we're, like, five. And we're, like... <laughs> We're 20 minutes into the episode. We need, we need to stay on track. Let's okay. get going. <laughs> they decide that they're going to hit the bars on what is called the Royal Mile. And that is just the the street of pubs and bars. Is That's what they call it, is the Royal Mile. Now, Christine Eddy and Helen Scott made their way into a few of those bars along there. Um... And they ended their night at the World's End Pub. Now, just to tell you a little bit about this pub, uh, the pub's name is taken from its location. It's at the very edge of the city on this, like, ancient wall. And they say beyond this point lay a completely different world to the one Edinburgh citizens of bygone age knew. And inside the bar... Uh, the end, uh, the world's end bar. They have a sign that says, "Behind these walls is the world's end," which I thought was kind of neat. That is amazing marketing. Yeah, it absolutely. Whoever came up with that was a genius. Now, on the misty night uh, in October nineteen seventy-seven, the both teenagers uh, went in for a final cocktail before closing time. Now, Helen lived at her home with her parents, and she did let them know that she was heading out for the night. She said she would be home by 1130, because she was not a, a late night person. She was more of a, you know, be home at the time that she's going to be home, because she doesn't like staying out later than that. Christine was already living on her own, compared to Helen. Um, so, she, Christine had left school at age 16. She was working at a surveyor's office and shared a flat in Abbey Hill uh, with a 29-year-old friend, Tony. It's 29 years older. Oh, 29 years older. So he was he, he was yeah. 45. Woo! Girl, you're crazy. Mm. Just a friend. He's just a friend. They say she's just, just a friend. friend. I don't believe that. I don't know. Something keep going on there. She's got, maybe she's got some daddy, daddy issue, you know, likes, likes an older man. Now, Helen had met up with a, a school pal of theirs, Jacqueline, uh, for a drink at the Mount Royal Hotel on Prince Street uh, before the pair made their way down to the governor's bar to catch up with Tony and Christine. Together, they went uh, to a few pubs along the Royal Mob before making their way to the World's End Pub. Helen and Christine grabbed a few of the remaining seats, and no sooner than they had settled in, they attracted the attention of at least two men at the bar. Dun, dun, dun. Now, both girls enjoyed their drinks and some conversation. And later in the evening, they were seen leaving the World's End Pub together, located on High Street, at closing time. So the bar's closing up, they leave together, and they seemed fine. Now, what they didn't know was that when they were leaving, that that would be the last time that they would be seen alive. Except by the killers. Killer or killers, yes. Oh, did it, it, well, I just assumed you said two men. Yeah, I said at least two men. Now, there was many other men at that bar. So, who knows how many men turned turn to look at them. Could have been more than two. Could have been six, twelve. I don't know. 
197. It was a busy night at the bar, okay? How do you know that? Every bar's busy. (laughs) Even dive bars are busy. All right, so on the following day, they find Christine's naked body in a Goldsford Bay, East Lowthin, Lowthin, by hikers. So basically, um, some people found her dead body, and six miles away, Helen Scott's body was found unclothed in a cornfield, and both girls had been beaten, gagged, tied up, raped, and strangled to death. And no, there was obviously no attempt to conceal the bodies. They were, like, white out in the open. There's no fucks given. Zero fucks given. They just left, like... I mean, I'm not exactly sure what happens. I And I think even from the poli- after the police investigation that we're going to talk about, I don't think... I think the only people that know exactly how this played out was Helen, Christine, and our killer. I think they're the only ones that know exactly how this played out. And God. And God, yes. <laughs> Drive me crazy, boo. Drive me crazy. Now let's get into the police investigation. We have the, the border police and Lautzan. What, whatever that, I'm sorry, I'm butchering that so bad. Lothian? Lothian is what I would guess. Lothian uh, police are, are conducting a high-profile investigation. So this was really big news. These were two young girls, you know, they were beautiful, and they just get murdered in this, in this city, uh, this small city, and it shocked everyone that it's, not something that happens, like the, just the the shocking nature of this crime. There's also a tourist spot too, right? So this is probably yeah, like scaring people away. Yeah, exactly. Now they had a list of over 500 suspects, and talked to over, and they I I, I read that they took over 13,000 statements from members of the public. That is a lot of statements. That's a lot of people to talk to. That's a lot of work. Yeah, that's a lot of... I, I can just imagine the size of this inquiry. So, well, I mean, at 500 suspects, like, even if you, like, let's say... That's like every, but every man that was at, at a bar that night. Let's say you're working doubles. So you're working 16 hours a day. Each interview is two hours. That's only eight a day. Divide that, you know, 500 by eight. Off the top of my head, it's probably, what, 60? It's like every single day for two months. That's insane. Now, despite their best efforts, they were unable to identify a culprit at that time. Now, the case commended widespread attention in the Scottish media at the time, and a photo uh, a photo booth picture of the two girls was used by police uh, in their appeal for information. At the time, the media reports uh, that several witnesses had told police that they had seen Helen and Christine sitting uh, near the public telephone uh, in the bar, uh, talking with two men. See, I told you, it was two men. I'm right. Neither of these men were traced or have presented themselves to the police at this time. They, you know, they could not figure out who these two men were. Nobody knew them, so, which is understandable, you're in a city, so... Not everybody knows each other, and it's not like a small town where everybody knows every single person that lives there. Or they could be from out of town. Who knows? They could be, you know, Americans or whatever, just traveling, you know. They could be vagabonds. Yeah, exactly. Somebody on vacation or whatever. But nobody knew who they were, so, and they never uh, presented themselves to police for questioning. Well, I wouldn't either if I just killed someone. <laughs> yeah, neither would I. Uh, just, uh, just a reminder, guys. If the cops take you in for anything, request a lawyer right away. Don't say anything. Well, this is over in England. They ain't got that. 
I mean, I'm sure they uh, had something. I'm similar. sure if they get taken in, um, if they're allowed to say no comment. That like the police can ask; they don't have to respond. I would also they like to make an official apology to every Scotland person, Scottish person, because I just called it England. Oh my gosh! Yes. Do not come across the pond and kill me. <laughs> There was speculation that the killings had been the work of two men was heightened when it was revealed that the knot used to tie the girl's hands behind their back were of two different types. I mean, if a guy, if it's one guy, he's using the same knot to tie them. If there's different types of knots, that tells me, depending on the knot, you have somebody that possibly works in, like, seafaring like fishermen, because they use a lot of different knots. Navy uses a lot of different knots. Or did your Scotland's Scouts. version of yeah, the Boy Scouts? Yeah, their their version of the Boy Scouts. I mean, there there's very limited. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to tie knots, but people tend to tie knots the same. But why use two different knots if it's if it's one person? Why use two different knots? And variety is the spice of life. I mix it up every now and then, babe. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's terrible. <laughs> uh, in May of 1978, the police announced that they were scaling down the investigation and our case goes cold. But that's not it. That's not the end. That's not the end. I swear to you, that's not it. So in 1997... The police open up a cold case unit for further investigation, and they were trying to use uh, forensics. So they reopen the case, and they start pulling the DNA and having it profiled because, you know, that DNA profiling technique was recently developed in England at that time. Came out of a college. A lot of our episodes are going to be similar to this, yeah. right? Because yeah. that's basically why people don't remember these is because they went cold. Yeah. It wasn't a big deal. I'm sure that uh, in in the Scottish media, you know, they maybe every couple of years they would do like a, a rebroadcast of information on it. Yeah, but know, think, just think to of how, to keep it alive. Think of how much bigger it would have been if these guys had been caught in a week later. Oh, it would have been so much huger. Yeah, yeah and I mean, you, you talk to someone, this is 20 years after it would this have, happened. Yeah. You know, you, you go to your, your buddy Steve, and you're like, yo, Steve, you remember that from 20 years ago? He's like, I don't know, I was probably drunk. And But, like, a week ago, you know, I, Steve, you remember a week ago? That, that murder? He goes, yeah! They just called the guy. Oh, my God. Oh, really? my God. Now, it's, it's in their head for, like, another month. Yeah. So basically, they reopen up the investigation. They start pooling the DNA. And this resulted in the isolation of a DNA profile of a male. One male found on both girls. The DNA of the original 500 suspects was analyzed and compared to the new sample. Wait, wait. This wasn't the case where they... uh. Were they forced everyone in the town no. to get... No? That was no, something different? that was a different case, yes. Oh, okay. Completely different case, but that is interesting, because that one was in England. This is in Scotland. Or was that oh, Wales? Or I don't know. I know it wasn't over here. Yeah, and the, the police, they asked That him, would never fly over here. <laughs> yeah, that would not. We would have, like, people just protesting openly, and that, that would never happen. Our government probably wouldn't allow it. It would be the government doing it. What do you mean it wouldn't allow well, it? Well, it, not the federal government. Like, local government, maybe. And then you could still say no. We're, we're going to tie this all back together. <laughs> MK Ultra. Yes, MK Ultra. <laughs> oh, the federal government wouldn't allow it. MK Ultra. Oh, yeah, they probably would. Never mind. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you remember I said there was 500 DNA samples that they took um, that they analyzed none of them matched all that it did not match the profile that came back from our main suspect yep so on october 8th of 2003 uh following the broadcast of a reconstruction on the bbc's crime watch program which is sort of like our our um 
America's Most Wanted. Yeah, America's Most Wanted or uh, in in Hot Pursuit or something like that. Both have the same guy on it, by the way. John Walsh. He just seems to be on all the crime stuff. You know? So the police receive a phone call from a man claiming that he was out walking near uh, Ghostford Bay on the night of the murders, and he saw a suspicious vehicle. He said he saw a work van that was being driven erratically. Uh, The man did not originally come forward with this information during the initial investigation, uh, and it was revealed that immediately following the Crime Watch broadcast in 2003, Police had received 130 calls from witnesses who had not previously made themselves known to the investigation. So they're they're out of those 13,000 people that they talked to, they missed like the 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 130 that they actually needed to talk to. And all these people come forward. What is it? 25 years later. Yep. 26 years later. Which is insane. Well, I do I, you remember what you were doing 25 years ago? probably uh, out playing in the front yard. There are 130 people over in Scotland who said they do. <sighs> That's insane. <laughs> That's crazy. I Like, listen, I can't remember what I did like five minutes ago. <laughs> you were recording a podcast. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> really? <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> I, we, we need to stay on topic. <laughs> you need to stop drinking. Yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> on the 15th of October in 2003, it was reported to the press that the border police had enlisted the help of the Forensic Science Services, or the FSS, to try to determine the identity of the persons whom the unknown DNA sample belonged to. It must be like their FBI? Uh, so, it's their... Their, their forensic science services. I'm not really sure if that's like their FBI. Like, I would assume maybe. I don't know. Maybe maybe if somebody from Scotland can let us know. Go to our Facebook page and let us know. Yes, please. <laughs> so the unknown sample was partially matched to 200 profiles in the National DNA Database. So there, there was 200 profiles that... Partially matched, but not it, it not was 100%. Inconclusive. It was inconclusive. Now, on November 25th of 2004, there's a break. There's a break, but they're not, they don't really know that it's a break yet, okay? So, there's this guy named Angus Robert Robertson, Robertson Sinclair, a man who had been living in Edinburgh at the time of the murders, was detained under Section 14 of the Criminal Procedures Act of Scotland in 1995 in connection with the murders. And on March 31st of 2005, when after they had gotten that DNA sample from him and it was tested and it came back positive, he was arrested and charged by the police for both murders. Well, that was easy. Yeah. T- it took some legwork, but they eventually got there. Now, on April 1st of 2005, he appeared in court on petition uh, in private at Edinburgh's uh, Sheriff Court. And was charged with the murders and rape of the two girls in October of 1977. He made no plea or declaration at the time and was remanded into custody. So he was staying uh, in prison at her queen's pleasure. I wonder, like, I'm assuming petition means like arraignment. Yeah. So Fair. that, yeah. I'm learning stuff today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I just love how they put it, like, oh, he he was uh he was remanded uh into uh the care of Her Majesty's prison system. And, like just how they word things. I just love it. So formal. Like here we're just like, oh, he's going to sing sing. 
<laughs> no, if, I mean, if you ever watch the real trial, they always, it's a lot of formal language. Yeah. They'll say, yeah, the, the prisoners remaining in custody. Yeah, to... pending a uh, hearing on X, Y, Z, you know, yeah. in, the, in the care of whatever, the Pennsylvania. Uh, Department of Corrections. Yeah, or something like that, yeah. Uh, but we, we just ain't got a queen. Yeah. Because we ain't like that over here. No, we're not. <laughs> we ain't about that life. <laughs> now let's talk about the trial. So his trial starts on August 27th of 2007. And the indictment alleged that on the night of October 15th to the 16th of 1977, Sinclair and his brother-in-law, Gordon Hamilton, forced uh, Christine and Helen into a motor vehicle. What, what are you doing making finger quotes? I'm like... On a podcast. <laughs> podcast. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I, for some reason, I keep acting like they can see me, but they can't. So, th they believe that him and his brother-in-law forced both girls into, the into his vehicle and held them against their will uh, on St. Mary Street near the World's End Pub. It was alleged that he drove Christine Eddy to Ghostford Bay. And then attacked her. They gagged her with her underwear, tied her wrist before raping her, and then killing her by choking her to death. He was further accused of raping and murdering Helen Scott in the same manner. And they believe that they then, after killing Christine, they drove Helen to a road near Haddington and raped and murdered her in a field. So Sinclair pleads not guilty to the rape or murder, and he says basically that it was his brother-in-law who did it. Now, at the commencement of the trial date, uh, Sinclair lodged two special deferences: one of contest and the one, and a second of incrimination. So he contested it. And then he said, you know, but I'm not going to incriminate myself. So no self-incrimination. So that's like our, our Fifth Amendment here in the United States. See, and he stated that any sexual activity between him and the two girls had been consensual. And that if they had come to any harm, that the person responsible was Gordon and not him. Now, the jury of nine women and six men began hearing evidence on the 28th of August. I wonder if they have one deer. Because I could not imagine a defense attorney allowing two-thirds of the jury to be women. That's 60%, not quite two-thirds, but... I'm sure they do. I mean, that, that would be kind of important to, to like question in your jury pool i but sure i don't know how they how they select their juries in england and scotland i don't know so it could be different from ours it's a french word so i mean they probably have that i mean our court systems are loosely based on each other so i mean we had their their court system previously you know back in 1700s? I mean, it, it, yes, our, our system of jurisprudence is based off of yeah. English common law. So, yeah, so I would assume that they do have Valdir. I hope I pronounce that right. It's like, you can pronounce it like virtually however you want. <laughs> like, I'm not kidding. I, I When I was in college, I had a class on this, and you can pronounce it Valdir, Valdir, then there's like, then there's like four other pronounce, pronunciations. Okay. No one really cares. Now, we're going to talk about the evidence. So, there's no eyewitnesses to the murders. And the Crown's case was basically circumstantial. So, I mean, they had DNA samples, but he's saying, like, hey, no, I had consensual sex 
with both girls, you know, because I'm, I'm just a stud like that and can just, you know, take care of business. Uh, whatever happened to them after I last saw them, that's not my fault. Just because the other guy who probably did it was in the van with me at the time doesn't mean anything. Yeah, exactly. So Detective Constable Karen Craig noted that Angus Sinclair owned a Toyota caravan. So basically a van. He owned a work van that was a Toyota at the time of the murders. And only problem is that since then, it's been destroyed. So they don't have the van. As a result, uh, she confirmed that the police were unable to carry out forensic testing on any of the fabric or upholstery inside of the vehicle. So there's no forensics there. A forensic scientist, Martin Fairley, uh, gave evidence that semen obtained from a vaginal swab of Helen and semen obtained from vaginal swab from Christine shared the same DNA profile. Another forensic scientist, Jonathan Whitaker, gave evidence that the semen match swabs taken from Angus Sinclair uh, was found, uh, matched the cells with the DNA profile from Helen Scott and on a coat belonging to Helen Scott. So they found not only vaginal uh, a swab found DNA, they also found uh, contact DNA on her coat from him. That this, None of this proves anything. None of this proves non-consent. Yes. I mean, there is the two dead bodies, which is probably, you know, the whole murder thing. Yeah. And we do have we do have an eyewitness that saw a van driving erratically. We can't confirm that that was the same van, though, because it's been 25 years and that van is no longer existing. He also told the court how brothers and sisters of Sinclair's dead brother-in-law, Gordon Hamilton, had provided samples for DNA testing and that the results of the test had been compared with the semen found on the bodies of the victims. He said basically that the DNA would have matched if it was Gordon Hamilton was involved. The DNA would have matched. So he's blaming his dead brother. Yeah, so he, yeah, he, Sinclair is blaming his dead brother in law who can't defend himself because he's fucking dead. So he's like, nah, that fucker did it. I didn't do it. He totally did it. Wait, but how would your brother in law's DNA match? If your DNA match. It's not like, I can understand, like, because it was a partial match. I could be like, no, it was it was my brother. But, like, your brother-in-law has nothing to do with your DNA. Yeah, exactly. So, Whitaker was the final witness for the Crown's case. On the afternoon of September 7th, 2007, Senior Counsel for the Defense, Edgar Paras, QC, made a submission under Section 97 of the Criminal Procedures Act of 1995 in Scotland that Sinclair had no case to answer to in respect to the charges due to a an insufficiency of evidence. So, so if I was to translate that into American, uh, I believe they made a motion to dismiss? Yes. Based on... The fact that the D- there's no... The prosecution failed to make a prima facie case? Yes. Okay. Exactly. So that was a lot of big words, babe. I don't know if they're going to... They don't watch uh, those uh, Legal Eagle videos like you do. <laughs> hey, Legal Eagle. If, in the very, very small chance, you ever happen to listen to this, how you doing? And he continued on in saying, in particular, he contended that the Crown had failed to lead evidence that Angus Sinclair had been involved in acting with force or violence against the girls, and that the advocate deputies had not led evidence to prove that any sexual encounter between him and the girls had not been consensual. And on September 10th of 2007, following legal arguments on the matter, the trial judge, Lord Clark, upheld the defense's submission of no case to answer and formally acquitted Sinclair before putting it to the jury. No 
no <laughs> effing way. This guy made a motion to dismiss, and the judge is like, yeah, go for it. Yep. He was like, there's no evidence. Like, you you have DNA. He's saying it was consensual. We don't, there's no evidence to suggest that it wasn't consensual. This is a plot twist. Yeah. We we don't get innocent people on this. Well, we sh- we don't get not guilty people on this show very often. Oh, this, this isn't the end. Oh, God. Oh, no, 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 no. It's not that cut and dry, babe. Not even close. So following the conclusion of the trial, it was revealed that Angus Sinclair was already a convicted murderer and sex offender who was serving two life sentence, sentences at Her Majesty's pleasure at Peter's Head when his case was brought forward in the World's End murders. Oh, so, so the judge probably looked at him and was like, this is not worth our time and energy and money. You're already in jail for the rest of your life. Yes. Uh, yeah, dismissed. Back to yourself. <laughs> yep. And it was also revealed that Sinclair had previously com- completed a prison sentence for culpable homicide. Manslaughter? I'm assuming so. Or, or second degree murder, who knows? Yeah. I'm not sure how the term terminology works out there. It's a little weird. Uh, we don't use the same words. <laughs> So Sinclair's first conviction occurred in 1961 at the age of 16 when he pled guilty and was convicted of culpable homicide of an eight-year-old girl named Kathleen Reinhill and served six years in prison. Now listen, here in the United States, you murder a child, that's hard time. He was only 16. Oh, fuck. Yeah, well... But still, here in America, you're going to get at least, you, you'll get sentenced, okay, you were 16, and then they passed that one law. Well, um, th- there's a lot of, there's a lot of places where you won't, you basically cannot go to, if you are tried as a juvenile, you cannot go to jail past like 27. Obviously he didn't, because he got out in six years. Sinclair sexually assaulted and strangled her in her family home. And in 1982, five years after the World's End murder, he pled guilty to 11 of the 13 charges for various rapes and indecent assaults committed against young girls and was sentenced to a life imprisonment sentence. Okay, so this is kind of weird. I was thinking about this earlier. So I wish I would have brought it up so, like, you don't think I'm lying. But when you were describing the case, I just thought to myself, I was like, I don't understand how someone could only ever do this once. And then I, I actually had a weird thought. It was a bad thought. And I go... Oh, I think I understand serial killers more than I understand someone who would do that just once. Oh, shit. L- like, in my head, I, I could rationalize being a ser- serial killer more than I could just going and doing what they did at World's End just once. Yeah. Because, like, in my head, I was like, how do you do that just once and then just walk away? I was yeah. like, it almost makes more sense just if you're a serial killer. Mine as well. And he was. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, he was not a good guy. Following... That 1982 verdict, in June of 2001, while still in prison, he was went on trial again and was given another life sentence for the murder of a 17-year-old uh, Mary Goucher on a footpath near the Barn, Barnhill Railway Station in Glasgow in November of 1978. 13 months after the World's End murders. It, was, it seemed he was a very busy boy around that time. So we have 13 assaults and rapes. We have three murders. We have one from when he was uh, a teenager. He's at, what, four murders? Plus uh, whatever else he did. Like, who knows if that's the extent of uh, his criminal enterprise, as they would say. Now, Mary, uh, that teenager that I was just talking about, had been dragged into bushes, sexually assaulted, and then her throat cut and a ligature tied around her neck. Again, uh, Sinclair failed to accept any responsibility for the crime and denied all knowledge, despite being found guilty by a majority verdict and facing uh, and was faced with the reality of the chance of a DNA sample matching Anyone else other than him were a billion to one. So basically, they, he had a, like it was like a hundred percent DNA match on that case. 
Just deny everything till the end. Oh, yeah. Wasn't me. But, well, what's did they say in Shawshank? Everybody's guilty here. No, everybody's innocent here. That's right. Everybody's innocent. Because that's what they all said. They all say, I'm innocent. I was framed. I was framed. Nope. Nobody did it. Uh, so Sinclair was only caught for the 1978 murders after a cold case review by police revealed the presence of new DNA evidence, just like our case of the World's End murders. Um, so they uncovered that during their uh, initial investigation. So they did find DNA. They were smart enough to say, hey, you know what, let's hold on to this. Maybe we'll be able to do something with it in the future. And they stored it, and it was 100% usable. They were able to pull a profile from it. News of the verdict drew widespread comments and criticism in the Scottish press. Such was the level of the public interest in the media. In the outcome of the case on September 13th in 2007, the presiding office of the Scottish Parliament took the unusual steps of having the Lord Advocate address the Scottish Parliament on the matter. Uh, the Lord Advocate uh, read a prepared statement to the chamber setting out the narrative of the Crown's case and explained her reasoning for deciding to prosecute. She is recorded in the official transcripts of her address as saying that she was disappointed with the result and that she was of the clear opinion that the evidence that was made available to the court was sufficient to put before a jury and to allow in the opportunity to decide the case against Sinclair. Now, in response to that, on September 26th of 2007, the Lord Justice General, Lord Hamilton, took the unprecedented mood of publicly criticizing the Lord's Advocate's decision to address the Scottish Parliament on this case. In an open letter, Lord Hamilton wrote, The plain implication from your statement is that you were publicly asserting that the decision of the trial judge was wrong and explained that her actions could be seen to undermine the public confidence, basically, uh, it undermined uh, the public's confidence in their in their ability to prosecute correctly. In the following weeks, uh, several former Scottish judges uh, became involved in this debate. And on the 28th of September, former Solicitor General and retired Senator of the College of Justice, Lord McCluskey, gave an interview to the Herald stating that he believed Lord Hamilton had no grounds to accuse the Lord's Advocate of threatening the independence of the judiciary. Th this sounds an awful lot just like political grandstanding. Oh, trust me, there's a point to this. So just, just let me, just let me get through it, and I promise you, it's like one of the best chess moves in this entire case. You, you had better deliver. Oh, believe me, I will. So he is quoted as saying, saying this. He is quite wrong. What he fails to see is that sometimes essential that it is sometimes essential for a minister to comment upon a case. It happens all the time in Parliament. Another retired senator of the College of Justice, Lord Prowsfield, gave an interview on BBC Scotland's Sunday Live program, stating that the real issue here is whether a decision of this magnitude should always be taken by a single judge. So as you can start to see, there's some question as to the legal consequences. Like, should one judge be responsible to hand down this decision? Or should it be a panel of judges responsible for handing this down? Okay, guys. So in our original recording, we went way over time uh, when I was talking about this next section of our case. And this would be the legal repercussions of this previous trial. So now we've started to hear the rumblings of, you know, some changes that everyone once made to the, the judicial system in Scotland. And 
that happens with uh, two very important laws that are ratified and changed by the Scottish Parliament. That first one would be ability for the Crown prosecutors to basically uh, reopen cases or seek appeals against decisions made by trial judges in certain cases. Cases like um, the murder of uh, Christine Eddy and Helen Scott. The second one is they make a change to the double jeopardy law of Scotland, um, making various provisions for circumstances when a person is convicted or acquitted of a offense so that they can basically uh, re-prosecute those cases. Now, following the induction of both of those laws, the prosecutor's office requests that the police department uh, reopen the investigation into the murders of Christine Eddy and Helen Scott. And three judges set aside eight days of court time in October of 2013 to hear a bid from prosecutors who wanted to press for Sinclair to stand trial for a second time. So in reality, all they did was say that they allowed the judges to dismiss uh, without yeah. prejudice. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so basically all of that was them setting the groundwork to have a new trial. It took a couple years. I mean, 2007 to 2012. But they, they got her done. And on the 15th of April in 2014, the Crown was granted permission to bring a new prosecution case against Angus Sinclair. The trial started on October 13th of 2014 at the High Court of Judiciary sitting in Livingston. At one stage, uh, the jury visited the scene of the murder. So they actually took them out to go see where both girls were murdered. And on November 14th, 2014, Sinclair was found guilty of the murder of Helen Scott and Christine Eddy. Following the conviction, Lord Matthews stated Sinclair, uh, uh, sentenced uh, Sinclair to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 37 years. That means he would, this means he would have been 106 years old before being considered for parole. Uh, he uh, did later die at Her Majesty's Prison in Glen Glenchel at age 73 on March 11th, 2019. Coincidentally, he died on the same day that the BBC's Crime Watch re uh, Roadshow program profiled the murders. It was meant to be. It was. So he, he got away with it for a time. And then, you know, they, they just took the time because they knew he was on a life sentence. And they just put the laws into work. I, I, I kind of like this one. Just the law stuff in it. Yeah, no, that was interesting. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's, a, it's something different. It's something that we haven't heard before. You know, we know a lot about the American court system. Not because we've been in it or anything. But because we watch a lot of TV and a lot of YouTube and a lot of Law and & Order and crime. <laughs> ID channel and stuff like that. Because if there's one place to learn about the law, it's from TV and YouTube. Exactly. If it's on TV, it's got to be real. <laughs> R slash bad legal advice. <laughs> All right. So that is everything that I have on the world's end murders and Angus Sinclair. So I'm just going to close this out with my usual stay sexy and don't get murdered. Mm -hmm.